Okay, since it gets really appropriately quiet, uh, let me say uh, good afternoon to you. My name is uh, Wolfgang Danspiel Huber. I'm the uh, director of the Liechtenstein Institute on Self Determination. And I have to tell you that um, this room has seen countless events on Afghanistan, about Afghanistan, and mostly for Afghanistan and the Afghans. The um, Liechtenstein Institute on Self Determination. Uh, has been um, involved um, in Afghanistan uh, in part uh, because of my own love for the country. I wrote my first paper on Afghanistan in 1982, where many of our young ones have not known <coughs> that Afghanistan is existing at all. Uh, and um, I have had the pleasure to uh, visit the country many times and to fall in love with many of its citizens, of its residents and of its representatives. And one person who has really grown over the last decades uh, to my heart and both in trying to win his heart and mind and he tried to win my heart and mind is Ambassador Sahir Tanin. Dr. Sahir Tanin, who is originally an MD, and uh, I am absolutely delighted that um, we could um, uh, welcome him and especially also his wife today uh, back, back to Princeton University, but this time under auspices of another program. Let me only quickly tell you one or two words about why I think that this event is of particular relevance. Afghanistan has been for generations, really for centuries, on the cusp and on the crossroads of um, age-old influence from east to west, from west to east, and yes, the perspective and projection from north to south. And Afghanistan has a unique <coughs> geography, geopolitical heritage, and especially cultural heritage, where one of, for you, perhaps most memorable moments was one of the most educative moments um, to see how Afghanistan is misperceived, and that was when the New York Times a couple of years ago reported that Afghanistan, now they're suddenly uh, discovered all these amazing um, geological treasures in Afghanistan and um, um, from uranium to gold to uh, lapis lazuli to you name it uh, and we are finally going to mine and to harvest these treasures. I couldn't resist to write a letter to the editor at that time and remind them that since 6,000 years has there been mining in Afghanistan. And since, if I'm right, 4,000 years has there been wines in Afghanistan. And in the 1960s and 1970s, Afghanistan belonged to the uh, world's most important exporters of berries and nuts. So, no, <laughs> this is not the country which has only seen um, um, disaster on occupation on internal strife. Uh, this is a country of deep cultural heritage and of great human and economic and other resources. And very few people, like um, Ambassador Tanin, have managed to project this continuously over their professional life, where we will hear a lot from uh, Jeff Florenti, uh, and over their um, international life, where I can be um, a witness in his role of presenting Afghanistan, not just as a country, but also as an actor on the international stage, from the UN Security Council, if I dare say, downwards in UN agencies and um, operations. But Afghanistan has vanished now from the news. Afghanistan is gone. And so people assume Afghanistan, we finished it. Mission accomplished. And alas, I have to tell you, it ain't like this. 
And I also would like to say that each time the international community has withdrawn in nearly panic just to get out of something, they had to redeploy in this very place, eventually in emergency later on. I think we owe it to the Afghans, but we owe it also to our young men and women and to blood and treasure spent on Afghanistan to resist that temptation. And I think it's very important to find new ways and means for the international community to remain engaged with Afghanistan. And then our purpose of the, of the Richard Fine Institute is particularly to uh, keep the next generation of Afghans involved with us and offer them whatever we can. So with this, I would like to uh, introduce the president of the uh, UN chapter here at Princeton, Mr. Vincent, and then uh, also Mr. Jeff Laurenti uh, to um, give um, uh, the introduction. And I'm very delighted to be able to um, um, welcome the couple of Mr. and Mrs. Ambassador uh, Tallinn here to Princeton. So, Jeff, sir. <coughs> Hi, my name is John Vincent, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the Princeton Trenton Area Chapter of UNA USA, which, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is an organization designed to and has been active ever since 1945, uh, with its ups and downs, to promote uh, positive U.S. Uh, interaction with the United Nations for the benefit of this country and for the benefit, we hope, of the world. And to that end, we promote dialogue, discussions on international issues, uh, particularly the ones that are on the UN agenda for the year uh, in question. And uh, since Afghanistan is certainly an extremely important issue on the UN agenda that this year, uh, we decided this would be a very good time to have him come. Uh, Dr. Tannen come and discuss what is a, a very important issue, whether our media right now want to consider it that way or not. Uh, and to this end, uh, our board, our local board chair, and who also wears the hat of uh, the S senior international fellow at the Century Foundation in New York, and uh, and it's known Dr. Tannen for quite some time in the UN context, uh, will give the formal introduction uh, since um, uh, he's the appropriate one to do it, and also in his own past he at the UNA. Uh, USA uh, national level uh, worked very closely with an important task force trying to work out uh, a peace uh, steps for Afghanistan. And uh, if any of you care to join, we'll be glad to have you as members. But in the meantime, uh, Jeff Loretti. Uh, first, my understanding, Ambassador Tanin, is that this is being recorded so unlike uh, Wolfgang, who masterfully spoke to the audience assembled here, wandering around the, the room, uh, for your voice to be recorded and made permanent and immortal, you're going to have to speak from behind the podium. Uh, Professor Danspeck Gruber had noted that Afghanistan has all but vanished from the news in the U.S. It's the war none of us really wants to remember. Alas, it had virtually vanished from the news back in 2000, excuse me, yes, in 2002, when having won a seemingly effortless victory in uh, dispelling the Taliban regime from Kabul in the space of six weeks, uh, Washington very quickly turned its attention to the war that it really wanted to fight. Uh, so Afghanistan was already an orphan for American policymakers 11 years ago. Uh, and that is a difference, a notable difference from what is the theme of, of, tonight, of this evening's um, lecture, which is the role of the United Nations, uh, which frankly had to be part of the title in order for us to have Ambassador Tannen here, since in the division of responsibility between the embassy in Washington and the mission to the United Nations in New York, uh, he is free to go out on the road talking about the UN, uh, but not about bilateral relations, although he knows them intimately. And I think that uh, in the Q&A, we'll be able to get into that uh, in great detail at your initiation. 
The title for this afternoon's talk, Left Behind, of course, summons for people of a certain age a certain popular movie of the 1980s of a kid left behind fending for himself on his own. And in a sense, as we're looking toward the imminent withdrawal of the international security forces from Afghanistan by the end of next year, uh, it will indeed be the United Nations that will be left behind. Now, back in the 1990s, we had had a previous kind of such experience. Uh, the United States closed its embassy in 1991-92. The UN mission stayed. Uh, the UN mission had actually been sent during the Soviet intervention period trying to mediate an end to that war, to that intervention, uh, and then the Soviets had insisted, we're not talking with these mujahideen. Uh, we'll talk with their sponsors in Islamabad and Washington, those who arm them, but not to the mujahideen. We don't recognize their legitimacy. And of course, the mujahideen did not recognize the legitimacy of the uh, communist-led government in Kabul. Uh, so the UN attempted uh, patiently to mediate an end of the war, proposed a comprehensive settlement. All that Washington would go for was a kind of face-saving withdrawal for the Soviet troops and then let the mujahideen take it over, which turned out not to be quite as fast as had been expected. We closed our embassy, the UN stayed, the mujahideen uh, succeeded once the Soviets cut off their funding, but not until that point. Uh, the UN provided asylum to the last communist leader, Najibullah, uh, which was respected by all the Mujahideen factions uh, who didn't attempt to break into the UN uh, compound. But when the Taliban arrived, uh, they had no such scruples and they dragged Najibullah from the UN compound where he'd had asylum for uh, three years. Uh, and he met a very grisly and shockingly mutilated uh, end. Uh, the UN, again, futilely tried to mediate an end of the conflict between the Mujahideen factions of the Northern Alliance and the Taliban uh, when the American intervention helped the Northern Alliance to overthrow the Taliban in late 2001. The UN became the, uh, the vehicle for organizing international recognition of an interim government that then became the basis for a constitutional republic. Uh, and as we tire of this military role and as Afghans tire of having us there, it's going to be the UN that will be doing something, we don't quite know what, uh, to keep the international engagement alive. And I think that that is what uh, should be an interesting subject for us to explore with a person who is superbly and uniquely qualified to talk on that. Ambassador Zahir Tanin has represented Afghanistan at the UN since 2006. By the standards of UN diplomacy, that makes him an old UN hand. <laughs> <laughs> right, among the longest serving because normally folks get rotated out after three to four years of burnout. Uh, there are a lot of receptions you have to attend and a dreadful number of mind-numbing speeches you have to sit through. There is the legend uh, that uh, is often cited at UN debates that uh, uh, everything has been said about this subject but not everyone has yet said it. Uh, so you are prepared to sit through many more uh, hours of torture in order for everyone to say the same things. Uh, Ambassador Tanin, however, has transcended what you might expect, a country that is as embattled and almost is a war dove, the international community, as Afghanistan has been over the past dozen years. Uh, and this is a sign of the peculiar politics of the UN where a, an ambassador, a permanent representative of talent, transcends the relative weight that his country punches in world affairs. Ambassador Tanin has been chairman of the Intergovernmental Negotiations on Reform of the Security Council, uh, an issue that actually is fairly important for the future architecture of international peace and security. Uh, also a very difficult role, and I hope in the Q&A that people will raise this. 
uh, because trying to square that circle is one of the great tests of diplomacy, and Ambassador Tannen has moved uh, that pretty far along. Before his appointment by President Karzai as ambassador to the UN, he had been a journalist working for the BBC for 11 years from the time roughly of the Taliban takeover uh, until uh, 2003 and 2006. Uh, he had, in fact, uh, been a research fellow at the University of London, at the London School of Economics, uh, in 1994-95, in effect, um, wisely seeking an alternative place to be during the worst years of the Mujahideen civil war. He had begun his career in 1980 as a journalist in Kabul, uh, early during the period of the communist uh, regime in, in Kabul. He is married to, and we are privileged to have with us uh, this afternoon, uh, Dr. Zahuna Tanin, uh, and I would ask you to join me in welcoming Ambassador Tanin here for, with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for everybody for being here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my, really my pleasure to be again uh, here amongst you in Princeton. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, to extend my thanks to Professor Wolfgang Dunspeck-Gerber, an old friend uh, who has dedicated uh, his energy and, and time largely for Afghanistan, understanding of the region, and uh, to help both America and my country and countries in the region uh, how to work together, how to understand each other, and how to contribute to, to international peace and security and cooperation. Thanks for being here, and thanks for the kind words you started with. Uh, President uh, John Vinson uh, from uh, uh, United Nations Associations, U.S. UNS and uh, here uh, the Princeton chapter, as they say, as you say. Thank you very much for your presence, for your introduction, and having me here. Uh, Jeff Laurenti, uh, an old friend, uh, also, and we, I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to work with him in different occasions on different issues, whether it was Security Council reform, uh, the panels he chaired. He has a. Had largely contributed to a, an important idea that we, we focus uh, now in Afghanistan, the uh, search for a political solution, national reconciliation, uh, through a task uh, force or uh, group that was established uh, thanks to the Century Foundation, uh, Ambassador, uh, uh, under the leadership of Ambassador uh, uh, Pickering and Brahimi, and he played a very important role at that time to, in producing a report that is still, is still essential for, uh, for policy making in this area and for the efforts that are still being engaged. And I'm very thankful for your uh, very kind introduction. Uh, <clears throat> I hope uh, uh, today's discussion will, uh, will help provide a clearer sense of the different uh, uh, perspectives on what uh, lies ahead of Afghanistan uh, and its uh, <coughs> partnership with the international community, uh, particularly with the United Nations. Uh, I will uh, share with you an introduction and my views about uh, how uh, we move towards 2014 uh, when, uh, uh, I mean, and, and, and beyond uh, towards transition and, and after. Uh, as uh, as, as uh, it requires, uh, if I'm a little bit uh, uh, official here or, uh, uh, or, or I'm, uh, I'm trying to be sharp, uh, sh short here, uh, it, 
it doesn't mean that we cannot discuss the issues uh, later in Q and A part and more uh, uh, interactive way. Uh, as I said, the countdown to the end of 2014, when the United States and uh, international forces uh, have planned to leave Afghanistan, has uh, already started. For Afghanistan, it's a process of transition to full uh, Afghan sovereignty, national ownership, uh, and leadership, and an effort uh, to realize a noble uh, vision of a peaceful, stable, and uh, uh, democratic and prosperous uh, nation, one that is able to meet, to meet uh, the needs of its citizens independently. Uh, 2014 is viewed in. Uh, it's okay. Fine, thank you. 2014 uh, uh, is uh, viewed in the United States public debate uh, as the end of a long uh, military presence in Afghanistan, longer than two world wars. In Afghanistan, the discourse is not only about ending of war, uh, but focusing on the responsibility to manage the future. <coughs> to make sure that the left behind, uh, the post-rupture uh, earth, as depicted in third movie of uh, Left Behind series, is less desolate and bleak. And uh, since 2010, following the presidential elections in Afghanistan, we uh, worked with our partners and allies to develop uh, the parameters of a transition, one that characterized by strengthening national ownership uh, and leadership and the realizations of Afghanistan's uh, self-reliance strategy. New uh, partnership between Afghanistan and the international community are a necessary part of the shifting situation in which uh, the primary role of the international community in dealing with security and development of Afghanistan based on, inter and of, uh, on uh, an international collective uh, mandate, uh, in the Security Council mandate, uh, will change into a resourcing and assisting role during the transition and following decade of transformation. Last year, Afghanistan and the international community, through uh, continuing dialogue and agreements made in Chicago uh, uh, last May, the Chicago NATO summit, summit in May, the Heart of Asia Conference in uh, Kabul, and uh, the Tokyo Conference in July. Uh, the Heart of Asia Conference in Kabul was in June, and uh, the Tokyo Conference in July uh, undertook a new focus on the needs of uh, transition and all aspects of future cooperation between Afghanistan and the international community. However, details of these agreements uh, including the post-2014 international uh, security support for Afghanistan are still under discussion. The overarching uh, component of transition is sovereignty uh, through national ownership, as I said, and national leadership. After more than a decade uh, of shared efforts, uh, strengthening uh, sovere sovereignty entails, uh, from our point of view, normalization of the situation through security, political, and economic transition. For Afghans, sovereignty means strengthening and solidifying <coughs> control over their own future. A successful and orderly transition to Afghan ownership is about a continuous focus on, main, on four main priority areas. First, the realization of uh, full national sovereignty requires a successful security transition. By the end of 2014, Afghan forces will be fully in charge of the defense and security of the country. 
addressing the immediate uh, threat of uh, terrorism and violence uh, or in a violent uh, insurgency campaign and the absence of foreign forces. We have the, completed uh, the first four phases of, uh, uh, out of five in our security transition plan. <coughs> With each phase, Afghan forces have assumed greater percent of uh, Afghan population, of the Afghan population now lives in areas under uh, Afghan security responsibility. Uh, the fifth phase, which uh, entails the transfer of full security responsibility to Afghan forces, uh, is crucial. One. Uh, recently, the debate has been uh, here in Washington and also in Kabul, uh, when and how this uh, new phase would start, and how uh, this transfer of full responsibility to Afghan forces will be conducted in a responsible manner. Uh, this is why uh, we think this is a big challenge, but uh, we are ready for it. Uh, and uh, it is uh, important to note that uh, in this effort, we are not alone. Uh, the continuing international military assistance, essential for enabling the Afghan army and police for an independent role in years to come, will provide us with a solid basis of support for success of our ambitious security transition. Uh, such a role, as defined in uh, Chicago last uh, May, as training, advising, and assisting mission, instead of international security assistance mission that is, that is now in place, ISOF, uh, will be the core of post-2014 international military engagement in Afghanistan. As Mr. General Dunford uh, talked about it yesterday also in Washington, and uh, uh, it has been discussed recently, uh, we are, uh, they, are, they are still, as they put it in, in their military language, there are battle gaps that should be still filled by, by international assistance after 2014 which means that we are uh, working with uh, the United States uh, and also with our NATO uh, partners how, uh, how to agree about the details of post-2014 arrangements and uh, in, in uh, the division of responsi the, 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 the responsibilities that to be to share uh, in that time in a different form. Second, it's obvious that a military solution alone will not bring peace to the complex conflict in Afghanistan. In reality, uh, reconciliation of armed, uh, group, uh, armed groups uh, that are ready to join the peace process and the mobilization of Afghan uh, people uh, through communities and uh, uh, regions are essential for extending uh, the legitimate basis of uh, the government and ending the violence. Uh, we, have, we see reconciliation uh, as something that is important for the security transition as well as political transition. So it's a conduit between both security and uh, political uh, uh, transition. Uh, but first of all, a political solution through reconciliation uh, would be essential and crucial for, for uh, uh, a security transition that is, that is the basis of, of uh, uh, success in the next stage of our efforts in the country and, and stabilization efforts in the country. Uh, we have already taken several concrete uh, measures uh, to further reconciliation process. Uh, I think uh, you, some of you may be aware that the High Peace Council, uh, a body that is in the center of this reconciliation <laughs> process and peace talks, has uh, the express purpose of uh, facilitating negotiation with the integral, with, with the Taliban, in order to galvanize uh, reconciliation talks uh, that have been 
an integral part of these efforts uh, so far. More recently, President Karzai and President Obama have both agreed on the opening of uh, a Taliban office in Qatar, which provides a necessary venue for opposition uh, representatives to enter into direct conversation with the High Peace Council. Uh, at the same time, we have been working with Pakistan uh, at different levels, bilateral and uh, government to government. Also, the peace, High Peace Council delegation was there in November presenting the roadmap for peace to the Pakistani authorities. Also, through a trilateral uh, uh, mechanisms between Afghanistan and Pakistan and the, and, and the United Kingdom. And uh, we have also the trilateral mechanism of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, and the United States. Uh, so, and there are other, uh, uh, we also use other means of, of, of relations with Pakistan for, uh, for this purpose. Uh, so, we have at hand uh, these various mechanisms to assure uh, Pakistani support for peace and reconciliation process. There are many uh, other initiatives and diplomatic efforts underway in support of Afghan-led and Afghan-owned process uh, that we can discuss it in Q&A if necessary. Third uh, is the political transition, which is also essential for national sovereignty and stability of the country. Uh, Afghanistan is preparing itself for choosing its new leaders in a year's time. It would be the third uh, presidential elections in a, in a time that the foreign or the international forces are going to leave Afghanistan. Uh, the Afghan people are keenly focused on a successful uh, political transition and all eyes are on the important milestone of the election next spring. Preparation for the elections has already started, including logistical arrangements like voter registration. Yesterday in Kabul, there was a, a big consultative meeting under President Karzai, uh, where uh, consultations among all various groups, including the political opposition and influential leaders, started to choose the new leader of, uh, of the Afghan Independent Election Commission. Uh, uh, and then at the same time, it was decided that the Afghan uh, parliament will uh, soon decide about two laws that are important for preparation of the elections. Uh, so there is, a, uh, every day, well, it is more clear than before that Afghanistan is certainly moving towards the election that is very important for uh, the Afghan people to see that can, the country is not uh, going to be again on the track of uh, bloody change of power as it happened in, in the last 30 years. And, uh, and uh, uh, it has been, uh, or it was, the source of the suffering that Afghanistan uh, has gone through. Uh, at the same time, it's very important from our point of view and also from the international community's point of view, including the United Nations, to manage a credible elections. Uh, and, uh, uh, an election that's to be fair, and that's to be transparent and inclusive. And inclusive. Uh, so uh, this is a widespread uh, desire for such a process, one uh, that does not uh, fool uh, insecurity. The government of Afghanistan expresses the importance of an Afghan-led, Afghan-managed elections and the international community has expressed support for Afghan leadership of the process. Fourth, uh, to achieve a full sovereignty, uh, Afghanistan must also undergo an economic transition. Central to this uh, will be uh, adherence to a self-reliance strategy and uh, through planning to ensure sustainability. Uh, we face economic fragility as a result of many years uh, of conflict over 60% of Afghan population is under age uh, of 30. Uh, I was talking to Professor Lansbeck uh, Greber uh, before coming here that uh, uh, how a country can see in, 
uh, in, in uh, its youth gen population a source of hope, but it also, if it is not, uh, it's not a generation to see a future for itself, and it is not going to be integrated in a, uh, a process of uh, 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 reconstruction and development of the country, uh, then of course they can be a source of danger for peace and stability. Uh, so, in a country that is that that has uh, that that over 60 percent or under 30, uh, in Afghanistan is also as a country that is living in poverty, and there is a big, uh, uh, I mean, a high degree of unemployment, the challenges are tremendous. These challenges necessitate the enhancement of aid effectiveness, uh, which include everything from ensuring alignment with uh, alignment of the aid with national priorities to maintaining transparency in spend, spending aid and spending of aid and keeping aid on budget. Uh, by on budget, we mean uh, how to support direct, directly the national budget, uh, which is important for national ownership and national leadership. And most importantly, uh, here, uh, we have to have also have a focus on building a strong national economy uh, with a strong Afghan institutions, which uh, will be key to create a non-aid economy uh, in the next decade and implement our self-reliance uh, <coughs> strategy through the transformation decade from 2015 to 2024. Last July, the international community came together uh, at a conference in Tokyo with the aim, of, uh, the aim to guarantee that the withdrawal of international forces will not uh, uh, compromise Afghanistan's steps towards uh, achieving sustainable development. Uh, the Tokyo Mutual Accountability Framework, something that we agreed in Tokyo, defined a new deal between Afghanistan and the international community, and some $16 billion was pledged towards uh, development priority areas until end of 2017. As we committed in Tokyo, Afghanistan is ready to be held accountable for every cent it spends, uh, and that we need the international community to stand firmly with us and fulfill their pledge, pledges as we work towards uh, our national priorities. Without a doubt, uh, these four priority areas uh, can, o can only be achieved with ongoing support of both uh, our international and regional partners. During transition, uh, the relationship between Afghanistan and our uh, international partners will evolve. And, uh, their strength will prove critical to long-term stability in Afghanistan. Successful transition is not only uh, to avoid a resurgence of the brutal war and conflict experienced in the uh, 1990s, it's vital for peace, security, and stability of the region. There is a fear that if transition is not successful, it will be a destabilizing factor for the whole region. Afghanistan has actively worked together with the regional partners in the last 12 years in forging a new phase of cooperation through establishing various forums uh, of political uh, security and economic cooperation. This uh, has created a strong basis for positive exchanges uh, to ensure these uh, fears do not come to fruition. Afghanistan is playing a central role in the heart of Asia process uh, a process that started since two, has started in, to, since 2011 in, uh, in Turkey. And uh, this, uh, uh, and uh, we had, uh, we agreed on a series of confidence building measures with all countries in the heart of Asia uh, in, in uh, June 2012 in Kabul. Uh, and we are expecting now the next meeting of the Heart of Asia is going to be held in Almaty in a few days. Uh, so this process of, uh, of uh, 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 was called first the Istanbul process, now the Heart of Asia pro uh, process is what that is taking shape as more important form of cooperation between the countries in the wider region. 
and uh, we also there there is a big discussion last time I was here about how Afghanistan and other countries can uh, uh, can find themselves in the bigger map of a, a greater region, uh, which which is uh, essential not only for peace and stability but for uh, uh, our increasingly globalized uh, economy economically globalized region, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which is not only about Central or South Asia or West Asia, but a bigger Euro-Asia region. Uh, this is why Afghanistan uh, uh, also uh, actively involved in uh, other uh, for forums of cooperation like ECO, SARC, and it's an observer at uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, and other other forums. Uh, so we we think uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, this uh, partnership of Afghanistan with the countries in the region are uh, mutually beneficial. And Afghanistan, uh, as Afghanistan can serve and should serve as an economic land bridge in an increasingly globalized region eager for prosperity. Uh, as Afghanistan enters in a new area of foreign relations, we also turn to meaningful bilateral and uh, multilateral agreements. Over the last two years, uh, we have established uh, several strategic bilateral partnerships with a number of our allies designed to see us through the transition period and carry on uh, long after. Uh, in May, Afghanistan and the United States signed the strategic partnership agreement followed by recognition of Afghanistan as a major non-NATO ally of the United States. Uh, do it may perish from, as you said, uh, from the news, but the prospect uh, as we see it uh, uh, is about uh, a new beginning in these relations, uh, of course, if both sides are uh, able to, uh, to step in their, uh, their own half of the way. Uh, we have also uh, formed the strategic bilateral partnership during the last two years, as I said, with Australia, with France, Germany, India, Italy, Norway, and the United Kingdom. And our, we are finalizing uh, the framework of uh, our uh, strategic agreements with NATO, with the United, with European Union, and a number of other countries, and at least in the immediate future, Denmark, Finland, and Turkey. Uh, we, uh, uh, this new uh, form of bilateral uh, uh, agreements, uh, strategic agreements, is, is practically emerging as an alternative for, for the collective arrangement which brought some 48 country, uh, countries with troops and some 70 countries uh, uh, on, on a different way uh, as a part of Afghan stabilization and reconstruction efforts. Of course, the bilateral relations will expand when it comes to Afghan development and, and, uh, and, and uh, helping the country uh, in economic and uh, development area. But when it comes to the strategic relations, we are now moving towards uh, a normal situation where Afghanistan would be able to, to realize its relations uh, on a different basis, not on invoking the, the, security, the, 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 the security Council resolutions. Uh, we would be uh, remiss uh, in discussing Afghanistan partnership uh, without discussing NATO's role in Afghanistan transition. Over the year, NATO has provided tremendous support and assistance in increasing uh, uh, stability in our country. The NATO Defense Minister's uh, meeting in Brussels in February saw the beginning of uh, discussion on uh, their role in Afghanistan in post-2014 uh, time. They uh, reinforced their commitment to scaling back to a training, advising, and assisting role. This planning towards improved credibility, uh, capabilities based on Afghanistan's changing needs will no doubt contribute to the sustainability of Afghan-led Afghan, uh, Afghan, uh, Afghan national security forces. The role uh, of the United Nations during transition in beyond is one of the most important areas of relations of Afghanistan with the international community. 
uh, without what I said, it could have been it would have been difficult in my view to know where we are and how we relate uh, uh, during the transition and beyond with the international community. Uh, I will be very happy uh, if we, I address questions about the role of the UN in the past. Jeff uh, uh, made my life easier for give, with giving you, by giving you uh, a, a, a background perspective how the UN has been involved in Afghanistan. Uh, the UN has uh, uh, had a long and active presence in Afghanistan since 1980s when the situation in Afghanistan was uh, first placed on the agenda of the General Assembly. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, uh, UN uh, tried to help a peace process in Afghanistan and uh, at different stages of development, uh, particularly the political developments in Afghanistan, and the UN, uh, uh, in one uh, form or another, uh, maintained its presence uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and our Af UN agencies uh, had a strong presence not only inside Afghanistan in 1980s and 1990s, but also in. in among Afghan refugees in Pakistan and Iran, and extended it helps uh, uh, within the humanitarian framework uh, and uh, uh, increasingly uh, through development uh, operation, uh, which, uh, which is now uh, the core of the work of the UN agencies uh, in, 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 in the country. Uh, it was uh, Digo Cordovez, for the first time, who came in 1980s with his uh, formula for uh, a jerga and, and, and uh, talks between the Afghan groups when, uh, uh, when the, the, the conflict in Afghanistan was uh, uh, about the Mujahideen vis-a-vis -vis the regime in Kabul. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, the Cold War and the, the, the symmetry uh, or the balance of, of, of uh, the international balance that still uh, affected the situation in Afghanistan uh, did not allow the UN to play a very uh, active role in that time. Uh, do uh, uh, later, after the fall of the Najib's government in Afghanistan in 1992, UN tried uh, at still again in, uh, in various stages of, of a new conflict that was emerging uh, to pick up the pieces. Uh, it was a time that the United States uh, uh, left Afghanistan behind uh, or walked away, and not only the United States, the international community as a whole, and Afghanistan was a scene of inter fighting between different groups, and uh, the strengthening of the national government was faced with different challenges by different uh, factions and, and, and warlords. So at that time, UN, uh, UN naturally found itself in the center of mediation between different groups. But as I said before uh, in my con conversations with uh, Mr. Laurenti and uh, also the task group who work with the Constellation, uh, I think uh, uh, in under different personalities, the UN was not able to, to have a successful mediation role in, in, in search for a political solution in the 1990s. So uh, uh, it, uh, uh, the UN uh, in 19, when, uh, I mean, the UN became uh, uh, a, a different player with, a, with, a, with, a, with an expected uh, positive influence over the situation when in 2001, uh, after following the US-led uh, US intervention, which uh, resulted in the fall of the Taliban, uh, UN was allowed to, to 
forge a political solution between different groups. And it was under Mr. Lakhdar Ibrahimi's uh, mission in, uh, in Bonn that for the first time, UN could have uh, 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 pushed for a successful political solution. And our government was emerged through that negotiations, through that mediations in, in Bonn. Uh, so this was the time that, uh, uh, that uh, the UN uh, presence in Afghanistan uh, in the center of all the relations of, of the, uh, between the international community in Afghanistan uh, became something paramount, important for the international community as well as for Afghans. Uh, today, UNAMA embodies, you know, the, or the United Nations Assistance Mission for Afghanistan embodies the overarching uh, presence of the United Nations in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, as I just discussed, United Nations Assistance Mission was first established, established at the request of the Afghan uh, uh, newly emerged government uh, through Security Council Resolution 1401 in 2010, uh, 2002. Uh, and this was just after the a successful UN-led political settlement in 2001, or end of 2001, in, in Bonn. United Nations Assistance Mission, UNAMA, was originally conceived uh, uh, with a political and uh, peace-building uh, uh, mandate to support the emerging Afghan government. Uh, John uh, Reninger, a senior officer in the uh, Department of Political Affairs, uh, of the United Nations at the time coined uh, the term light footprint uh, to explain the presence of the United Nations political mission in Afghanistan, one which uh, would place uh, the newly formed Afghan government in the lead. With the international community uh, through the United Nations supporting Afghan efforts towards the political process needed to put the state back together. Uh, no, it, there is a people uh, attribute this uh, light fruit approach uh, to <coughs> Mr. Ibrahimi. It was not the term that was used by him, it, but it was the approach that was chosen by him. Uh, and, and I think he supported the, the light food print approach, uh, which, which, was, which was about a UN to support the national government rather than to act as a, as a as an international government, uh, and it was important uh, because of the Afghan history, the Afghan reality, and, uh, and uh, the practicality of such an attitude, which uh, proved later uh, right. Uh, the former Secretary of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, in, uh, notes in, in his uh, memoir, recently published, uh, uh, Interventions, a life in war and peace, uh, some of you might have seen or read it. Uh, he said that the UN aimed to provide, uh, I quote, provide discrete support to the Afghan in uh, building better governance from an extremely low base. Any UN political role had to be based on a genuine Afghan national consensus. And uh, United, Nation United Nations agencies should work to put the Afghans in the lead in rebuilding the country, end of quote. From this carefully planned approach, UNAMA started out as an office, however, as the situation evolved. Uh, UNAMA expanded its presence into all uh, provinces with a continual focus on four key areas of good, of good offices in support of Afghan-led uh, political processes, development uh, coherence, human rights, and coordination uh, of humanitarian assistance. If you look at the whole resolutions of, about the UN, UNAMA and UN general role in Afghanistan, it's all about these four areas that they are involved in Afghanistan. Uh, with the transition uh, apace, the Afghan government taking an increasingly uh, lead role uh, the question still remains 
uh, when the Afghan government take an increasingly lead role, the question still remains as uh, to the United Nations posture in Afghanistan uh, in uh, 2014 and beyond. In March, we supported a Security Council decision this March, uh, uh, last month, for a continuing UN role through March 2014. Uh, conversations have begun both in uh, the United Nations and in Kabul as to what form the assistance will take and how the United Nations can, be best, can best play a supporting role in coming years, particularly in post-2014. Uh, in post-2014, political, humanitarian, and development landscapes. Uh, from the Afghan side, there are three overarching issues. Uh, let me be short here. Uh, three overarching issues that will shape the role of the United Nations involvement moving forward. First, United Nations assistance must reflect the core of transition, sovereignty. Second, it's important to improve the coordination of the United Nations through applying the one UN concept for streamlining UN activities and pre uh, preventing parallel structures. And uh, third, we would like to see a more effective, efficient, and accountable United Nations. I would like just, uh, we can go back to that in Q&As if necessary, uh, to share with you uh, the fact that in 2011, uh, for the first time as a concerned country, maybe I don't remember any other examples in the UN, we asked for a comprehensive mandate review of the United Nations as the transition started in Afghanistan. Uh, we wanted to see how the UN can uh, uh, prepare itself for tying its role with the needs of transition in the years to come. Uh, the political missions or the UN agencies in many parts of the world where they play a very important a supporting role for countries emerging from the conflicts or countries in the conflict emerging from the conflict or living in mutated conflicts. In all three cases, they, they play an important role. One shouldn't underestimate the role, the sacrifice, and the energy they put for supporting these countries in Africa, in Asia, even in Europe, uh, if you go to Balkan, uh, as an ex experience. But at the same time, I think, uh, as Brahimi report in, uh, uh, in, uh, at the beginning of 2000, uh, or end of 1990s, uh, was, uh, it, it was a, a very important chapter for how, what kind of involvement the UN needs in, in the post-conflict situations, it indicated the UN need to be uh, sophisticated enough, alert, and responsive to the evolving needs of a world that we deal with. We cannot lead the world and administer, administer the world with the United Nations. We, the UN should support the emerging of national governments. We, the fragile countries, the, country, the countries that are emerging from the conflict uh, are uh, now uh, uh, representing 25% of, of the population of the world. So it's about some 20 uh, maybe now more than 20 countries that are not totally, generally out of the conflict. So for all these reasons, we think uh, uh, we need to be vigilant and uh, the UN should be responsive to, uh, the, uh, to the evolving needs of, of areas where they operate. This is why Afghanistan took that step, asked for a comprehensive review, Ask for the UN to see what, is, what kind of presence it should have in Afghanistan now and later, what kind of uh, role it should have in the strategic landscape, and how its uh, uh, humanitarian and development agencies would be useful, supportive, and not to act as a, as a, as a, as a uh, parallel structure, 
competing the national government, competing the, the, the managements of the funds available to the country, and turning the countries dependent to the UN capacity, to the UN resources, and the UN ability. This is why we need, we, I think we created a very, or we set an, a precedent and set an example, which is very important to see how the concerned countries, with the donor countries and the United Nations, can enter into a constructive dialogue to envisage an evolving, an evolving role. Uh, this is why we are, uh, we are here with, with very clear view about how to, uh, to, to have the UN, how to work with the UN, how to have a better UN. Uh, behind us rather than a UN that is replicating what is seen, the waste and corruption and of, of the local governments. The debate uh, about the UN and post-transition Afghanistan is not about, I would like to repeat that again, not about failing to understand the necessary role and significance of the United Nations. The negative scenario, uh, as uh, in, in the movie Left Behind, uh, when the UN in the form of uh, Gordon Curry will need to step in to rescue a lost situation is not one which I scribed. Uh, those who know the, the movie, they know uh, how this UN guy uh, emerged af when, uh, when, the, when the, the plane was in 30, 70,000 feet uh, in its way to London, and then how it turned into a rescue. Uh, so in Afghanistan today, some people think that the UN has a, uh, is a key in it, its hand that others may not have. And when the peop some people assume that, uh, that we are moving towards a disastrous situation, some uh, uh, theoretically uh, would like to see a UN to come and pick up the pieces. It is not what you can expect after 12 years of uh, engagements in Afghanistan and, and work together in, in the achievements we have. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is what I would like to, to, uh, to, to share with you as my own view. A successful transition means uh, not to be caught, from our point of view, in the grand stone of regional politics, but to keep the hard-won gains of the last 12 years. Afghanistan will never uh, again be a terrorist base. Transition is, thus far, for this reason, transition is a positive time for Afghanistan. Uh, if Afghanistan is a normal country, uh, uh, then uh, of course uh, uh, the relations with the world also would take a very different form. Uh, uh, it's time uh, to work with the international community towards normalization through achieving national ownership and leadership and ending the conflict. After nearly 30 years of crisis, the United Nations support in helping, in helping to built uh, in a strengthened Afghan institution has been imperative and will continue to be as we embark on transition and transformation decade. In order for Afghanistan to succeed, we will need the UN to take a normal role in a normal country. It will require mutual understanding and engagement to shape the assistance role in a way that matches the new dynamic in a new chapter in Afghanistan. This evolution might require some pulling back in open space for a revitalized Afghanistan to plant its feet firmly into the ground. Thank you. So, uh, may I lead off with a question? Because you have put, you have laid the ground a number of landmines that are worth expo uh, exploring. exploring, exploring. Uh, and and I was struck, the U.S. mission, the U.N. mission has to respect Afghan sovereignty, and you want parallel that more effective and accountable U.N. 
the world at large seems to want a more effective and accountable Afghan government to work with. So in quick succession, three um, questions, one that feeds the next. Um, do you see any prospect for a political accord with the insurgency ahead of next year's elections so that those elections can actually uh, be a way of ratifying reconciliation rather than simply perpetuating the conflict. Mm -hmm. If there is a peace accord, uh, uh, if there is a peace accord, do you then see a prospect for a kind of UN peace building commission role on steroids uh, to work with the uh, the parties that will still be suspicious and hostile with each other. And as it is, who is managing the $16 billion in aid commitments? Who's coordinating it? And do you have any confidence that once we take our troops out, Congress will still honor its side of the American pledge or out of sight, out of mind? And you have two minutes to answer. <laughs> So if it's two minutes, I will be <laughs> better off. Uh, we, uh, the peace talks still uh, yet not started. Uh, we are trying to, to move towards that. It would be a big uh, change. But we have the Qatar office. We have contacts with Pakistan. We, uh, uh, the peace, High Peace Council, Mr. Salahuddin Rabani was in with his uh, team in members of the delegation last November there to introduce a roadmap for Pakistanis. Some steps were take, taken. Pakistan also released a number of uh, Taliban prisoners. The Qatar office is, uh, is taking form. Um, then, uh, of course, how this negotiation starts, when it starts, what kind of outcome it would have, uh, when you come to a better conclusion. These are not the questions that I, I or anybody can answer at this stage. Uh, Afghans are not the only ones to control this process. Afghan, it's an Afghan-led, Afghan-managed process, but as you know, uh, we need Pakistan support uh, as, the Pax, uh, as the leaders of the Taliban are there. Uh, and also it's about uh, trust, a real cooperation between two countries. Of course, uh, this process should be supported by the United States, United Kingdom, and other countries. And the Arab countries also has their role, and uh, we, this is why we welcome the, the willingness of Qatar and some other countries there uh, to, to, be, to support the peace process. If there is uh, an accord before the elections, as I said, and I try to, to see this uh, security transition, reconciliation, elections, and economic transition together, because you cannot separate it. So of course, you will be, we will be in a very different situation. Reconciliation, as I said, uh, uh, or a political solution, is, 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 is important, and, and, and it, has, uh, it will have uh, an important effect on, on, on security, as well as for creating a new political framework that is, uh, that's important for the legitimacy of the government also. Historically, all Afghan government, in pre-modern time particularly, uh, it was not important who take, takes the power in which way, bloody or not. But what was important, not only in my country, in other countries in, in, in that part of the world, that how you can bring security and governance to the people. Of course, how you can also fend off your rivals. Uh, uh, that is part of, uh, uh, part of the legitimacy in winning. So for all these reasons, I think uh, uh, it would be important. But if not, Afghanistan should be ready to have an election uh, and to, to secure its election. Uh, you cannot wait for uh, an outcome. Or you cannot put an election on hold for an outcome to come. But it would be very important for, for the elections if there is a reconciliation of effect or outcome before the elections. Uh, I think this peace building commission, I mean, those like you who know that what, what uh, how these commissions, what these commissions are about, uh, they, they should, we should 
they, sh they, they knew that uh, the Peace uh, Building Commission is about helping with countries emerging from the conflict uh, and, uh, with, with the minimum of needs. Uh, how the, the UN and UN agencies can help uh, the, the reconstruction in, or to address the reconstruction and development needs uh, uh, and to some, ex to some extent the stabilization uh, efforts in most of these countries that are, uh, that are distancing uh, largely from the conflict. But we are in Afghanistan in a mutating conflict and the story of the last 12 years was about uh, 48 countries with troop contributions in Afghanistan, more than 70 countries with uh, uh, with uh, bilateral helps in, to be part of reconstruction and then developments of Afghanistan, some more than 25 international organizations, including the United Nations, that hugely involved in Afghanistan. The United Nations in Afghanistan has a presence of uh, only its agencies and funds and programs or a, uh, what, which deals with reconstruction and humanitarian and development issues. There, it's about 30 agencies that are very active in Afghanistan. The UNDP uh, is uh, uniquely operating in Afghanistan with one billion dollar budget a year. Uh, I don't think the the, the, com the the budget of the Peace Building Commission is one billion dollar. So it's uh, for that big scale of work. Uh, it's even such return. Uh, is not uh, not practical. Uh, but if, if we have an Afghanistan that needs uh, uh, UN helps at that level that is imagined here, uh, of course you can look at it. Uh, then of course uh, the third issue. Uh, we, by the way, we a, a normal country, a normal UN, uh, means that it should be the government of the concerned country, in this case Afghanistan, to, f to manage its funds, to use its funds, and to be in the center of, of, of le leading its reconstruction and development efforts. You cannot keep these countries always dependent to these agencies here. Uh, so I, I think uh, we, uh, we come here after 12 years with, with a very different view about the future. Uh, our vision is normalization. Normalization is maybe not a good word. Uh, in, in Farsi, it is a good word, but I don't know how it looks in English. I mean normality, <laughs> and a normal situation. 16 million uh, pledges and how it's going to be managed. I think the international community is very careful about that. Uh, corruption is an issue. Uh, how you use these funds, how, how it's going to be effective, how, how, uh, uh, how it's going to, how you are, the, how the donor countries can, uh, can uh, uh, give account for their constituencies and how the, the receiving country that is here is Afghanistan uh, is taking its responsibilities in a responsible management of these funds. This is why we created this account, uh, they call it this uh, uh, mutual framework of accountability. Uh, and we like to say it uh, MFA, right? Uh, right? Because it's concrete, it, it has an existence. It, it is well defined how the manage, uh, I, I, I alluded to that in my remarks. Uh, how these funds are going to be given, uh, for what purposes, how it's going to be used, what is the responsibility of the donors, what is the responsibility of the Afghan government, right? how, to make, how to be accountable. And this is, this is the core of that mechanism. There is an issue for the future also that how you use these funds. We have uh, the funds available now until 2015, and then you have funds that this 16 uh, uh, billion dollars until end of 2017. The question is how you uh, how you uh, 
make you can uh, uh, make sure that this monies are not uh, wasted on the one hand and at the same time for from our point of view it's important to make sure that this pledge is to be fulfilled because there shouldn't be a gap, right? So, so I think this mechanism is predicted. And there is another uh, uh, meeting now in Tokyo, in, uh, in uh, when it is? Next month. Next month. He's my colleague uh, uh, from the mission. Uh, so he is, uh, so we, in this meeting, the, the, the representative of donor countries in Afghanistan will look again into how the Tokyo framework is going to to work. Let me let me uh, um, change here a little bit to uh, Princeton rules and invite perhaps uh, two or three questions at once because there were several people uh, who would like to ask you before. And um, if you don't mind, if you don't mind, uh, um, take little note of the question. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. is not a permanent member. Uh, in the past it's been Germany, it's been Japan, I think this year it's Australia. I, want, I was wondering whether and how that affects uh, um, Afghanistan's relationship with the Security Council, the fact that the lead country uh, changes and that it's not a permanent member. And my second question is, what specific mechanisms the Afghan government would like to see put in place to make UNAMA more accountable? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's, it's always great to hear that the UN should be more accountable, but I was wondering the specifics as to how that can be. Clearly an insider perspective. Uh, um, uh, yes, please. Yes, yeah, thank you. Ambassador, uh, take us into your, your future in Afghanistan uh, when you're an even more senior UN official. Um, if, if you could uh, describe for us uh, the, the structure of the government that you would envision do you see a Taliban-Afghan coalition? Uh, what do you see in the future? Okay. So I think that's enough. Okay. <laughs> I, to accommodate more questions, I will be. Uh, I will try to be short. My wife just told me be short. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so the, the the idea of this. Uh, Pen holders, we, 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 that worked well. That worked well. It is not only Afghanistan. I think the, the rule in the Security Council is that one uh, member of the Security Council is, uh, is, is in charge of a, a, a country or a, an issue. Um, in case of Afghanistan, most of the uh, P5s, or the main P5s or the P5s are involved in Afghanistan. Uh, efforts and their view, there was, there has been a P5 consensus so far, uh, and the United States is is the main uh, provider of uh, military and non-military assistance to Afghanistan, as Excuse well me, as. I, I hope everybody knows what the P5 are. Yeah. Uh, Russia, China, France, the UK, and yes, the United States. So. Permanent five members of the Security Council. Yeah. So uh, it it worked with uh, all uh, these uh, countries that are two years there. We are happy this year. We work with Germany. Germany worked there and now uh, Australia is there and they took the responsibility. And when it comes to UNAMA, how they should be accountable? Uh, it, <coughs> UNAMA is an umbrella. Uh, we have, uh, and, and it is an overarching, uh, uh, all-encompassing uh, UN uh, structure there. We call it UNAMA, but the UN agencies, uh, funds and programs, have their own, uh, own mandate, own uh, uh, realm of work, own uh, budget. Uh, and and uh, so we, we <coughs> let's see this UN presence in Afghanistan uh, uh, and, uh, as part of good offices, also as part of humanitarian development and aid coherence area, and also human rights issues. UNAMA is dealing also with human rights issues. Uh, whether we should have a political UN that's dealing with this good offices, political pro Afghan-led, pro supporting Afghan-led 
political processes and also uh, human rights issues. Whether you should see it to be there for longer or not, that's a decision to be made after 2014. Uh, because it's a support for elections, support for reconciliation, support for uh, human rights issues. These are, these are important, but at the same time, if it's a normal country, it is, it is the essence of work of the national country to deal with these issues, rather than to be uh, uh, for, for the outside bodies to, to deal with issues that's part of the national sovereignty. Uh, of course, Afghanistan has its international obligations based on Afghan constitutions and should be commit a stick to that. And it's, it's responsible for its international obligations. And then, uh, of course, when it comes to the economic, uh, the, the development in humanitarian parts of the UN, uh, the accountability is a big issue. And it's an issue that the UN is also dealing with that. Uh, uh, we, the, they should share the audits, their internal audits with the concerned country. Uh, how they spend the money. They should share the information about how their projects were funded, were implement, implemented. So far, unfortunately, it hasn't been the case. For the first time this year, UNDP is sharing uh, its audit with, with us. For the first time, UNICEF is putting this year uh, its spendings on, on, online. Uh, so, uh, UN for UN, it's not, it, it, UN uh, has been questioned uh, publicly or uh, with the, through the internal debates how it spends. Because UN is not a fundraiser for a country. World, World Bank is giving us money. USAID is bringing money. But U, UN is using the money, managing the money. It's not, I mean, it's not that black and white. There are areas that UN is helping. Uh, its authorities also helping to raise money, but it's not a fundraiser for Afghanistan. It's not a fund provider for Afghanistan. This is why uh, the country, concerned country, has a big interest to see how the money that are pledged for the country is used uh, by the agencies. Of course, uh, if, uh, if you have a functioning government in these post-conflict situations, and if, if, if you have mechanism in place to make sure that the funds are used, they're more responsible and it's maybe less cost, costly uh, than international agencies uh, to spend the, the funds. Uh, but anyway, generally I can say that we are now, we would like to see that there should be a mutual uh, mechanisms in place that, that if the Afghan government, Afghan government is ready to be responsible, accountable for any penny, any cent that they spend, the UN also should share uh, its audits, its spending, and, and the details of its implement, implementation of the projects. So we need uh, to come on an agreement on the mechanism on accountabilities with every agencies in general, with all agencies, funds, and programs. There are details that I stop here and not going through it. Uh, how we, you, one can envisage uh, a settlement, I mean. Uh, there are speculations around. Uh, media is, uh, media, we read every day about, uh, about different analysis. Uh, so this, but our job as the representative of, I mean, the government I'm here is not to give you an analysis only. I have to share with you uh, the policies that we are uh, following. Uh, so, uh, the, the aim of the peace talks, with the I Peace Council is also is, is mainly involved, uh, is uh, how to create an inducive situation for the Taliban to be part of the political process, uh, including their participation in the elections. Uh, of course, you cannot come participate in a political, uh, political process in elections with your guns at hand, right? So you have to, you have to accept the constitutions, you have to denounce the, 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 the terrorism, and you have to, uh, to be part of this uh, peace process. 
Uh, I think that the peace talks and reconciliation process should open the door for the Taliban to be part of that the political life, political process at local and national levels. Uh, of course, we human beings always speak about uh, within or see the things within our past and uh, existing experience. So the human beings in our part of the world, <laughs> in our neighborhood, they see this uh, political process through what they experienced before. The experience of 1970s was, 1990s was, bring the Taliban with Northern Alliance, as they call it, and put them together and to see whether they can create a, a coalition and distribute these ministries between the different groups. That is uh, the pattern that was in place in the last, uh, before 2001 didn't work. Right? Um, Hikmat was uh, put as a prime minister, uh, people who are uh, familiar with these names. Um, I don't know, X was put as a minister with that mini in that ministry and other ministries. Then uh, it, it was not a solution. In Bun also, we followed that pattern a little bit, but I think it was followed by an election. Right? Uh, in, in, in a country like Afghanistan, even you have elections, you cannot ignore these complexities uh, uh, of, of the post-war situation, the ethnic politics, and the divisions lines. But it doesn't mean that uh, you, you, only, you can only base a political settlement of, of the distribution of booties, right? Uh, it is an old concept, right? Uh, coming from, the, uh, from a, a very different time. Now, I think uh, with the Taliban, uh, how these negotiations, if it starts and should start, would, would, uh, would evolve, uh, would develop. What kind of outcome you can expect? Uh, how they then relate with the peace process, right? Uh, I don't want to be speculative, but I think it's important to have this process in place. As I said, uh, in an ideal situation, it's, it is, um, it's desirable. Uh, maybe it's even necessary from the point of view of ending the violence and, and conflict, uh, to see a resolution to take form as soon as uh, before the elections. Uh, but as I said, uh, there are, uh, this is geopolitics that's stupid. And, uh, and people in, in, in our neighborhood need to understand that, uh, that that 2014 is not about an end, it's an, about a beginning. And, and through that, maybe we, we should see an Afghanistan that, that can move towards uh, a more stable situation. And this is why, in the center of this introduction, I put sovereignty, normalization of the situation. Please. Uh, I, there are two events, two important events happening in Afghanistan's history in 2014. And you pointed the out elections, which is very important for the uh, legitimacy of the new government. And um, obviously the withdrawal of foreign forces, which is very significant for the security. Now, there's a common concern that the fact that these both, both two important events are happening in the same year, in such a short period of time, the government would not be able to manage uh, it effectively. And it also puts a lot of pressure on the new government who will be, who will be uh, responsible uh, for its people. The second question, you have touched on it a lot, but there is this common question that the Taliban negotiations have been a huge failure ever since its start. There, and that Taliban is using uh, the negotiations to gain international legitimacy uh, or some kind of local legitimacy without really significantly uh, believing in the process. Now, is the is the Afghan is the Afghan government willing to put limit put strong limits as 2014 approaches because Taliban will be coming from a much stronger position after the withdrawal of foreign forces if they agree to negotiate to protect the constitution and the current government as it is and its vision. Thank you. Thank you. Any last question? Yes, please. You're talking about the, um, you keep talking about the Afghan government and what 
they're planning on doing. How, how much have you gone out to the local Afghan people and asked them if they're into this, if, if what they want? Um, my daughter is in Afghan right now, and um, she talks to some of the locals, and it's a wonderful country from, from what she tells me. But it seems like everybody is, is um, planning on doing things from the top down, not from the bottom up. Do they have plans on doing that? That's a brilliant question. goes with self-determination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I, if I start from your question, uh, from uh, uh, before coming to that, uh, I wish we, we could be in a different phase of, of the situation before this election. Uh, but of course, part of the history of the last 12 years not about the biggest achievements we had. It's also about wasted opportunities. Uh, since the Bonn conference, uh, when, uh, with the support of the international community, the new governments in Afghanistan emerged, uh, the attempt was how to, uh, how to go towards elections, uh, how to have people in the center. I was reading the other day about India. I hope there is nobody from India. Yeah, well, it's my <laughs> uh, there, there was a book somebody talked about how great this elections in India is. Even uh, in, in difference with the West, the, the national polit I mean, national biggest interests have very little influence over the outcome of the elections. Election is the biggest part of the Indian democracy. But India is also about poverty, India is about dollies, India is about corruption, uh, 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 big companies, I mean, so, I mean, if, if you're an Indian, you see this, these problems, but at the same time, nobody can ignore uh, how great this election system is that still makes India one of the biggest democracies of the world. Uh, so we, we tried to go to, it's the third election we are going. But Afghanistan is, uh, uh, is before coming out of the conflict, found itself in a different form of mutated conflict. The Taliban was back in 2006. They, 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 they started to, uh, to threaten the country and the stability. Uh, should, uh, I, I think, if, if you see the Afghan constitution, the Afghan constitution was based and was designed how to have uh, elections not at the national level, uh, parliamentary elections, but elections at provincial levels and also at the village levels. We haven't been able to have all these elections. We haven't be able, been able to move towards that, uh, that putting the people in the center. Uh, so uh, I hope any new steps you will take, including the, uh, you will take, including the next elections, uh, would uh, would help uh, to to have uh, more a uh, bottom up different approach where people would be in the center. Uh, this, is, this is maybe, a, uh, I don't know, uh, a sufficient answer to, the, to this big question, uh, but I think uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are hopeful that uh, uh, avoiding uh, another wave of, of war and conflict would help us to be more in peace and stability. Uh, your question was about. Uh, uh, can you? Oh, yes, absolutely. Shorten it. And uh, yeah, I, 
I just wanted to um, point out that there are two important events in Afghanistan. Relations, Relations and, and security. Withdrawal, yes. Uh, yeah, and whether uh, the government could manage both at the same time um, and such important events as it puts a lot of pressure on the, on the new government. Um, and also I wanted to ask about the fact that the Taliban are using, um, are using uh, negotiations as a, as a kind of, as, a, as an opportunity to gain international legitimacy yeah. because it gives them, like, uh, giving them an office, gives them that a bit of power to negotiate and come from a stronger position as the international forces are withdrawing okay. in 2015. Uh, managing these both transitions. You as your can make such a yes, I, I like this academic discipline. <laughs> yeah, you're, we should move. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's five past six. Uh, it is uh, uh, it's a, a difficult job how to manage both security and political transitions. Uh, in a time that uh, uh, people also uh, are uh, not certain uh, about how this future would take form. Uh, the issue how to manage these two things is not an issue that only we as the government of Afghanistan are dealing with. We, together with the Afghan international uh, partners, uh, trying to see this, how this shift of situation uh, can be managed uh, in a manner that Afghanistan is not going to enter into a new wave of conflict, war, and violence. So if we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, remain dependent on the support of foreign forces forever. But at the same time, the Afghan forces to take the responsibility still need a little longer to be trained, to deal independently with the situation, and to take the res responsibilities without any support from foreign friends and, 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 and allies. And at the same time, even if you enable the Afghan forces uh, sooner than later to take these responsibilities without assistance, uh, necessary assistance that is needed for some time. Uh, the question of the political legitimacy is still essential, not only for security, but for, uh, for taking <laughs> Afghanistan out of this uh, unstable situation, which is. So there is it, in, 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 a, in first glance, it looks like that we are dealing with two uh, big uh, problems at the same time, but this, this is about legitimacy and, uh, and, and security transition together. Uh, so uh, this is why I think uh, uh, I have to emphasize that the uh, we, it, it has been two, two years, more than two years, that we are preparing ourselves for such a transition. And we have to see all these elements together, not only just an election and just a withdrawal. And then we don't see this withdrawal as an end, as an end for the foreign military presence in Afghanistan. Uh, we are working on the arrangements, military arrangements of the inter, or international military <laughs> presence after 2014. When it comes to the Taliban, whatever they have in mind, uh, I think we didn't, we, we are not losing if we build confidence for the prospect of negotiations and reconciliation. The Qatar office is a venue where the representative of Taliban can enter into talks. Uh, the release of prisoners is not a loss for the Afghan government. It's an important step that the Taliban would feel that they are, they are not left uh, in no man's lands. Uh, so 
you can enter them into dialogue. Uh, uh, recognition, uh, I think the Taliban best recognition would be if they are part of the peace process. You cannot be a faceless turban uh, uh, ban face uh, there, uh, part of a killing machine, identified with brutality, uh, and, uh, and then still to, to claim that you are gaining a, a position in negotiations. It's not the case. I think the Taliban best credential would be if they are turning into a political uh, partner. We are not going to lose with that anything, if they are a political partner. Before thanking the ambassador, let me tell you there is a reception outside prepared and you are all invited to this. But let me uh, once again thank you um, to successfully manage uh, to speak about two mutually exclusive elements. The sovereignty and peace of a country which has said for all of us who are involved in political science, a generation of war, occupation and civil war and the capability of the United Nations to manage sovereignty and to be effective itself. Thank you. And so with all this, thank you. Thank you very much.